Welcome back, everyone, to the fourth and final part of our look at the story, the fascinating life of Grigory Rasputin, as we now go to the story of how he finally was brought down once and for all. So I'm excited to finish this story up. We are going to move on to some other things uh, after today. But as always, I welcome your input. If there's something you learned today you didn't know before, please let me know what that is in the comment section below. Check out the original content if you want to see more things like this. They have a great channel. Uh, and also, if you have not seen this series up to this point, there's a link in the description that will take you back to episode one. Let's dive into part four. Siberia, August 1914. Rasputin lies in his hospital bed, recovering from the assassination attempt while trying to stop a catastrophe. The Archduke Franz Ferdinand has been murdered. Tensions are rising, and government ministers are arguing over whether or not to mobilize. And if you've seen the movie The King's Man, Rasputin and Gavrilo Princip and others are all part of the same circle of people trying to bring mayhem to the world. Didn't really happen that way, but it's a fun way of looking at it. Day after day, Rasputin telegrams Emperor Nicholas in St. Petersburg, sending 20 messages in all, trying to influence him, begging him not to take the action he so fears. Do not go to war over the Balkans. He says it will only bring disaster, that it will be the ruin of Russia and bring danger to the imperial family. No good can come from it. He appeals to Alexandra, who behind closed doors has hour-long arguments with her husband over the question of war. And this had been an ongoing thing, and it continues to be an ongoing thing even after they do go to war. And I mentioned this uh, yesterday about how Alexandra would write letters to Nicholas at the front. Uh, telling him, our friend says this, our friend says that, meaning Rasputin, and she would be passing on advice that he was giving her to Nicholas. And by and large, if you look at some of the advice that we know Rasputin gave them, it wasn't bad advice. And in hindsight, he was probably right about a lot of those things. Yet as he lies in his hospital bed, Rasputin gets the news. The First World War has begun. He won't live to see its end. Neither will Nicholas or Alexandra. Thanks so much to Skillshare for helping to keep the history flowing. When police questioned Rasputin's would-be assassin, they quickly began to suspect that she'd been put up to the act by Iliador, a suspicion that only hardened once an informer told them that Iliador had paid the woman and tried to acquire explosives for a series of terrorist attacks. They came for Iliador at his home, but he fled via a tunnel dressed as a woman. A month later, he was in Norway writing a book about Rasputin called The Holy Devil. Meanwhile, Rasputin began to spiral. Already hounded by press and police attention, there was now the added stress of both acting as a spiritual advisor to a royal couple at war and the fear of assassinations. You gotta figure that that's pretty understandable. Somebody just came up and stabbed you, and it seems like it may have been part of a larger conspiracy. There are plenty of people who want you dead. It's hardly just some random, noseless lady on the street. People at the highest level of government want you dead. It would be tough not to constantly be looking over your shoulder. He started to become more the man his enemies made him out to be. Now, Rasputin had always had mistresses, and it appears he did sleep with followers and sex workers. But as the war continued, this got more brazen. The secret police logged him visiting sex workers, sometimes twice a day, and he openly propositioned society women. Also, while he as a pilgrim gave up alcohol, Rasputin resumed its use upon coming to court, throwing massive parties and starting to appear drunk in public. At one point, he became so intoxicated on a train that people could look into the window of his private compartment as he vomited, passed out, and wet himself. And while mm. the most infamous stories about his behavior during this period are fabrications, the real stuff was bad enough. He also gained unprecedented political influence, since Nicholas was frequently off visiting the front, leaving Alexandra with few close companions she trusted for guidance. In fact, Rasputin was in the imperial couple's lives nonstop. He wrote Nicholas with advice, telling him to throw his weight around as monarch, and even proposing policy. He suggested, for example, to delay the second military draft until after the harvest to minimize the impact on peasants. Reasonable. But Nicholas disregarded Rasputin's advice frequently. For instance, when he chose to take personal command over the army, a move that went against Rasputin's advice to stay close to home. And... You know, when you're dealing with a lot of upheaval at home and a lot of people who want you gone, the more you're at the front and 
yeah, that that's first of all, that's not good because you can't keep an eye on things back home. But also, that means that when things go badly, if you've taken personal command at the front and things go badly and things aren't going necessarily all that great on the front while Nicholas is there, it can be blamed on you instead of you being able to blame it on generals. You know, contrast that with Germany, for example, where increasingly as the war went on, it was in the hands of people like Ludendorff uh, and Hindenburg. And it really wasn't in the hands of Kaiser Wilhelm. Here, there's no doubt who was the guy who was to blame for this stuff. And it just became one more thing that they could pin on Nicholas and, and want to bring him down over. But to be fair, everyone knew that was a bad idea. Nicholas was already seen as weak and incompetent, and this would tie his reputation to a conflict that was, in every way, not looking good for Russia. Yep. Rasputin was far more successful exerting power through Alexandra. A power that mostly consisted of getting allies appointed to government offices and his enemies removed from them. Sometimes for good reason, like mistreatment of religious minorities, but at other times simply because someone's presence in power made Rasputin feel unsafe. And when opponents did cross him, he increasingly threatened to take it up with the Tsar. But the thing was, Rasputin wasn't being paranoid. They really were out to get him. Yep. More press campaigns hit him in 1915, but this time with a new and dangerous element. The claims that he was a German spy. And, you know, to be fair, it's honestly a little surprising that Rasputin lasted as long as he did, considering how many people wanted to bring him down, considering how long he actually was in favor with the Romanovs, that he lasts to within a few months of the end of the Romanov dynasty. I mean, it's pretty impressive. Pushing Nicholas toward peace with the Central Powers. A particularly toxic accusation, given how he was now so associated with Alexandra, whose already low popularity had dropped even further due to her German heritage. One Duma member, Vladimir Poroskevich, went so far as to give a speech, calling the royal couple marionettes of the evil genius Rasputin. And to speak a little more about the German thing, you know, you got to remember, at this time, this wasn't just a war against Germany and the Central Powers. It, it became a cultural thing. The countries of the Entente became very anti-German. Uh, you know, the British royal family changes the name of their dynasty from Saxe, Coburg, and Gotha, which is German, to Windsor. Uh, in America, people are changing street names from German names. Uh, in Russia, they changed the name of the capital from St. Petersburg to Petrograd because St. Petersburg sounded too German. Uh, so there's a lot of backlash and a lot of side eyes going against anything remotely German. And when you have Alexandra, who's already German anyway, uh, and you know is closely related to the Kaiser, who's her first cousin, uh, it doesn't help when you start throwing around accusations of German spy. And saying that Alexandra had remained a German on the Russian throne, alien to the country and its people. The speech was purposely incendiary. A year before, demonstrators had called to have Alexandra banished to a convent, and mobs had killed ethnic Germans in Moscow. It's interesting, too, to note one of the greatest monarchs in Russia's history, Catherine the Great, was also German. Uh, you know, most of the British royal family is German. The Germans kind of infected everything. I don't mean that as a negative. I'm just, for lack of a better way of describing it. Puruskevich was playing with fire, but a fire that drew others. Because after this speech, Puruskevich found himself approached by Prince Felix Yusupov, one of the richest men in Russia, who invited Puruskevich into a plot to kill Rasputin along with himself an army officer from an elite guards unit, and Grand Duke Dmitry Pavlovich, the Tsar's cousin. So let's talk about Felix Yusupov for just a second. Why is he a prince? How does that all work in this time period? So his descent comes from this, um, he's part of the house of Yusupov, and it, by the time it comes to him, his mother is the heiress to this to incredible fortune. Uh, they own a bunch of palaces in Moscow and St. Petersburg and other places. And, and so the name doesn't die out. He actually takes his mother's name, Yusupov, so he can keep the house going. They actually go back to the monarchs of the Nogay Horde. Uh, that's where they get their, their wealth from. And so this is a long time, very powerful family uh, that exists. And here's Prince uh, Felix here. And he ends up eventually going into exile at the same time the rest of the uh, Russian nobility does. And uh, ends up dying in Paris, I think, right around the time of the Second World War. 
December 29th, 1916, Yusupov Palace. A cold night in St. Petersburg, a good night for a housewarming. And that's what Rasputin has been told this is. A celebration of the palace's renovations nearing completion. Prince Yusupov, a man who has come to him for healing, getting close to him for years, ushers him into a basement room with a gramophone playing Yankee Doodle over and over. And that's absolutely true. There was a gramophone, or <laughs> early record player, playing Yankee Doodle. I remember that specific detail being really unique and interesting. Uh, some reports and a lot of what happens this night depends on what source you believe. So, it, you know, there's a lot of variations in the story and a lot of myth surrounds this. But a lot of uh, people claim that uh, the way that Rasputin was enticed to come was that, uh, that Prince Felix actually offered Rasputin could spend the night with his wife. Uh, and that, that was how he dragged him into this situation. Before dawn, Rasputin will be shot three times. That's the only thing we know for sure, because the only accounts of that night come from people who have every reason to lie, to shift and spread blame, to make Rasputin out to be a monster whose killing was justified by his demonic refusal to let death take him. Prince Yusupov's account, the most famous, claims that he served Rasputin cyanide-laced cakes and tea. Yusupov says that he sat there in awe as Rasputin gobbled them down with no ill effects. Next, he says, he pl Now, there's a couple of of theories about this if it did indeed happen with the cyanide laced uh, food one is that Rasputin had been building up a tolerance to this by taking a little bit every day other people say well maybe the cyanide was old uh, you know this happened during the assassination attempts before the successful assassination uh, on Archduke Franz Ferdinand the first guy the guy who threw the bomb that was supposed to kill the Archduke but ended up blowing up behind him um, he jumped over, I think, a bridge and um, had taken some cyanide, but the cyanide just made him really sick. It didn't kill him because it was old. A lot of people think maybe that's what happened here. It was old cyanide. It wasn't strong enough to do the job. Blight him with poisoned wine, which again did nothing. A man prone to believing in the supernatural, Yusupov began to panic. He says he went upstairs, got a revolver from other conspirators, and then returned, telling Rasputin to look at the crucifix before shooting him once through the chest. Stashing the body in the basement, the group dressed an army officer in Rasputin's coat and drove the man to Rasputin's apartment so witnesses would see him going home. Then they went to move the body. So you would think, well, wouldn't this be a popular move? Well, yeah, maybe with a lot of people, but not with the royal family. You don't want to be the one who gets this pinned on you, so you're going to try to mask your involvement. Now, later on, it's not going to matter, and he can be honest and tell this story, but initially, they did everything they could to make it look like they weren't involved. But when Yusupov lifted the corpse, it came alive. Rasputin wounded, clawed at his would-be killer, then scrambled to his feet and fled into the snow of the courtyard, the assassins following. And, and he describes it as like this crazed look in uh, Rasputin's face and that he had like this d demonic eyes. And of course, he had demonic eyes anyway. Uh, and he kind of goes into all this detail about how he got like almost like a zombie story that he's telling about this guy rising from the dead and, and moaning and screaming and freaking out. And, and finally, he shoots him again in the back as he's running away. And then he comes over and puts a bullet in his head. And even that ends up not killing him, according to them. And that is where Grand Duke Dimitri put him down with two shots, one point blank through the forehead. Then, with it perilously close to dawn, they dropped him off a bridge into a river through a hole in the ice. And this is cool because that's actually what that bridge looks like. If you see pictures of that bridge, it looks exactly like this today. Now, it should be noted that historians don't generally believe Yusupov's account. It doesn't match up to the memories of other conspirators, and Yusupov himself had a lifelong fascination with theatricality, melodrama, mm -hmm. and play acting. And there are plenty of other theories. But one thing most everyone can agree on. These guys were in no way professional killers. They'd never murdered anyone before. And because the post-mortem examination found no trace of poison, it's been suggested that Yusupov's supplier hadn't even given him real cyanide. Instead, the whole thing, from start to finish, seems like a drunken botch job by aristocratic flunkies. It's, it's like one of those movies you watch uh, where like the people are supposed to like pull off this big crime and none of them know what they're doing and they botch it from start to finish. And 
Uh, it's really, really fascinating. Uh, a movie that comes to mind is Horrible Bosses. Uh, I think the second one, they like try to pull off all this stuff and they just botch the whole thing from start to finish. That's kind of what's happening here. These are noblemen. These are people who don't typically get their, their hands dirty with stuff. And now they're trying to kill the most infamous uh, holy man, uh, mystic kind of mad monk out there. And they're trying to cover it up and they just mess up all of it. Alexandra insisted the plotters be shot. But Nicholas quietly transferred them to the front or confined them to their estates instead. And when word spread that the police had pulled Rasputin's body out from under the ice, people came to the river where they found him and scooped buckets of water as if it were sanctified. It was an Holy expression water. of the old Russia, one that did not have long to live. For two months later, when winter food prices led to looting and police opened fire, riots broke out. The February Revolution had begun, and by March... Nicholas had abdicated and was living under house arrest with the provisional government in charge. There was some rumor that that Rasputin told Nicholas and Alexandra, if anything ever happens to me, you won't ma make it six months. Um, it might be one of those apocryphal things that didn't really happen, but within a few months, you know, this did all happen. And if you ever see, you know, the February revolution actually takes place in March by our calendar, but they used a different calendar and it was February for them, March for us. Um, but yeah, and this is happening right as the United States is entering World War One, and right as things are kind of, you know, just it's just a really amazing time of upheaval, 1917, that spring. In October, the Bolsheviks seized control. Of course, this would have likely happened without Rasputin. After all, with 1.7 million Russians dead in the war, hunger throughout the country, and an aristocracy refusing to modernize, there were more than enough historical forces to drive change. But there's no doubt that Rasputin played a role, providing a concrete figure the opposition could rally against. And once he was removed, the criticisms he'd absorbed for years instead fell personally on Nicholas. One of the things I always talk about, and this is kind of nothing to do with this specifically, but in any system, whether it's a government system, a business, a workplace, a family, there always tends to be a focus of anxiety. Uh, whatever anxiety exists is focused on a person or on a uh, on something. For a long time, the focus of anxiety in the Russian uh, in the Russian nation, uh, all the things that were going wrong, all the the food shortages and the poverty and the uprisings and things like that and the war, was all focused, the anxiety for that was focused on Rasputin. Well, now Rasputin's gone. That anxiety is going to be focused on somebody or something else. And now it shifts to Nicholas himself. Whereas, you know, so in a lot of ways, like he said, Nicholas had been shielded from that because somebody else was to blame. Well, now there's nobody else to blame except Nicholas. In looking back, it's hard not to think of Rasputin as a figure of our modern age. One who, whatever the truth, had his public image defined through partisan press, conspiracy theories, and the distortion of fame. One whose memory could be defined by men like Iliador and Yusupov, who had both literally tried to kill him and then wrote books about him, casting him as a wicked advisor or fairy tale sorcerer who brought down a monarch. Ultimately, Rasputin serves as a warning against being seduced by a good story, one that's too cut and dry to be true. And if I'm not going to show it here, but if you are so inclined, there are photos of Rasputin after he was pulled out of the water. Uh, and in theory, at least, uh, the, the Tsarina had him buried on the grounds, I think, of the palace. Uh, and they think maybe he's there today, but we really don't know for sure. Because history isn't like that. It's messy, full of contradictions, often told by people who are unreliable, deeply biased, or that don't know the whole story. Yep. And if those stories work hard enough, they can change a man in the eyes of history into one who never really existed. And that's why it's important to always ask those questions, to always look at multiple sources, never assume that because you read something in one place that that is the truth. Trust but verify. That's the important thing when it comes to history. Uh, you know, I spend a lot of time uh, responding to people who post something, well, this is what is the truth about this because they read that somewhere or they heard that somewhere, uh, but the facts sometimes are very different, so it's important to gather as many sources as we can. But 
All right. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I did. Learned some things I didn't know before, and that's always the goal. We're trying to learn together. Uh, if you are interested in the American Civil War, I want to throw up a couple of links to some of my past uh, series I did. One is from my trip to Mississippi when I uh, retraced the steps of Grant's Vicksburg campaign. And the other is from my trip in late November uh, to the battlefield at Gettysburg. So if you want to check those things out, those links are up on the screen right now. We'll see you again tomorrow with some new content. Thanks for watching.